thank you so much. Uh, this is a huge audience, and uh, I rarely see this many people together in one place in Kauai. <laughs> so uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, but first of all, let me uh, make a correction in light of what. Uh... <laughs> interesting especially is that he offered commentary on it as he went along. And so sometimes there was some back and forth between him and Father Bill. And uh, they for, made the scriptures really come alive. And uh, uh, two years ago I gave a small uh, seminar to, uh, to the congregation here in our uh, little seminar room in the adjacent building. And it was also on evolution in the Bible. And Father Minor, the next day, came up to me and said how glad he was that this was going on. And uh, Sorry, but yeah. that was too hot. Yeah, it's pretty hot. So I'm, I'm deeply um, happy with the fact that, that what we'll be talking about today has his explicit <laughs> support. And that's what uh, he told me um, a couple of years ago. So, um, about evolution then, uh, so what I'd like to do is to talk first of all about what evolution is. Uh, many of you already know what it is, many of you did know and have since forgotten. So I'd like to review just what evolution is, and then discuss whether there's any uh, difference between evolution and the content of the Bible. Then after going into what evolution is and talking about the, uh, the debates that have surrounded it, I really want to uh, spend about the second half of the talk about what's problematic in evolution. Because it will turn out, it looks as though evolution's all done. Scientists are all agreed, they're all happy with it, but that's misleading in many ways because there's a great deal that still isn't understood in evolution. And I would like to touch on those so that you understand where where the controversy is within evolutionary biology. It's not all, all, it's not a set piece, it's not all done. So to begin with, uh, what is really clear are two main facts about evolution. First is that one family tree unites all of life. And the way you find this out is very similar to the way you would test for pedigrees if you want to know who the father of some child was or who the mother of some child is, you would go and look at the DNA and compare the DNA of the parent to the DNA of the child. So if you do that with animals across the board, what you find out is that there's this very large pedigree which unites all of life. And uh, tends to, the diagrams tend to look like this, where, believe it or not, we're even related to bacteria. And these, this side of the tree right here pertains to things called eukaryotes, which are animals who have, and plants who have cells that have uh, organelles within them. The bacteria over here just are straight cells, but don't have little chunks of, uh, uh, little chunks within them. But the eukaryotes have uh, little bodies within them like the chloroplast and the nucleus and the mitochondria. And then there, right over here on this tree, there are animals. So uh, here are all the various kinds of plants and single-celled animals, all sorts of things. Now, if you think about it, this didn't have to be this way. This is an empirical finding. So if you went out and you found out what the pedigrees were in nature, it could have turned out that there was one family tree over here, and it wasn't connected to another family tree 
over here, and another one over here. But the fact of the matter is that all these trees, all these lineages, feed into a common uh, basis. And the basis down here may be more web-like rather than tree-like. It's tree-like at the outer branches, but when you follow the branches down, then it gets kind of web-like and it's hard to see. But they're all connected anyway, even if it's not strictly geometrically a tree. And you see, if you just took the animals, if you go up to uh, up here, just expand the animal part of the tree, you get all the invertebrates, like sponges, echinoderms, which are the starfish, flatworms. And then if you go specifically to the mammals, you pull, it, pull out the mammals in here, then you get all different kinds of mammals, again, all on one family tree. So this is a really big fact that no one disputes that all of life is connected in one big family tree. Right? Now that's one fact. Now another big fact is that species vary in space and time. Now this happens to be a picture of uh, bumblebees. If you simply go around here, it'd be quite a, quite a trip uh, along the Himalayan mountains and so forth. You see that the color of bumblebees changes as you go from place to place. And this is true of any widespread species that's been in place for a while. Now, if it's just recently colonized, then there's not a lot of variation from place to place. And what happens is that this is the raw material of species in the future. So if there is a barrier that should come up geologically between, say, one half of the species range and the other, then this half just goes off on its own. And this half goes on its own. So when a widespread species is split by something like a big river or a mountain or a... a uh, ocean that pops up, something big like that, which means that it can't be connected uh, from one side to the other, then the different unconnected sides go their, set, their separate routes, and that's how you wind up getting separate species. Now, a uh, case that I worked on uh, quite a bit was involved a lizard, uh, the Anolis lizard from the island of Dominica in the West Indies. I worked a, a lot in the West Indies. Now this is really a, a microcosm of this phenomenon of species being very variable from place to place. <coughs> Dominica is about uh, 10 miles long by 5 miles wide. It's a small island, smaller than ours here. And if you land in Dominica, you can rent a car at the airport and you can start driving around the island. And what you can do is get out about every mile, or you know, every mile would be good, and just get out and look at the lizards on the trees. Now what you find is that in the south uh, western corner, they look like this. In the northwestern corner, they look like this. You see here they have a lot of reticulate coloration here. Here they're very smooth colored. This is this is the way lizards talk to one another with a little semaphore signal. These are the same genus as the anolas that you have here. The chameleons, these are anolas lizards. The chameleons that we have here primarily from Cuba, anolas carolinensis. And it's found in Florida. It was uh, brought to Florida. But it's the same genus. And there's another part of the island where you see a tail crest here. And then as you get into the mountains, they, get, uh, they pick up a green cast right here, and this is deep in the mountains, and this is what gives it the name Oculatus, <coughs> as though it has eye spots. So it's, there's no, they aren't separate populations, it's one continuous population around the whole island, and it's continuously variable as you go from place to place. And again, if somehow this island broke apart or split in the middle, the different halves, the different pieces, would then go separately in their own directions and turn into different species. But this island hasn't uh, broken apart, and instead you wind up seeing this great big uh, uh, melange, if you will. 
Now, the reason you see this in Dominica is that the islands in the middle of the Lesser Antilles, Dominica, um, Guadeloupe, and uh, uh, Dominica, Guadeloupe, and uh, Martinique are very old. They have uh, continental fragments in them. The islands between the center of the Lesser Antilles and Puerto Rico to the north, and Venezuela to the south, are their new islands. And if you go to those islands, there's not much variation from place to place within the species. But these islands right here in the center of the Lesser Antilles are really remarkable for this phenomenon. Now, this is the other big fact, that species are variable in place and time. And this is a really important insight that goes back to Darwin, because at the time Darwin was writing, it was contested that species could change. Okay? And the reason it was contested is by analogy to physical species, like water. Water never changes. It's the same everywhere and in every continent. Like, you don't have South American water or North American water. It's water everywhere. And the same thing for all the basic elements in the periodic table. But biological species, even though you use the word species for both, chemical species and biological species, they're fundamentally different because biological species change and have this lineage relationship underlying them, whereas physical species don't. And so this is the really main finding from Darwin, is the insistence and the recognition that species change. And that comes from the time when he was on the Beagle, and he was sailing into the Galapagos Islands, and he saw the species that were in South America, near Tierra del Fuego, and down in, in Chile. And then he got out to the, the Galapagos Islands, and he has these great quotes in there, how it's almost as though he would close his eyes and say, these species are almost like the ones I just saw in South America, but they're not. They're a little bit different. And so then he got into the idea that the species got from South America, got onto the Galapagos Islands. When they're there by themselves, they start to change. And so that's really the fundamental discovery. And then, of course, uh, he's also known for the idea of natural selection, which is a theory about why they change. But what's not contested is that they do change through time, and they are variable in space and time. And so why do they change? Okay, now this is the theory part of evolution, not the fact part. This is, the, the, this is where the explanation for the change comes from. And it's this story right here. Now, uh, first of all, you have the generation of variation, which is what we see is out there from place to place. Now, how does the generation get, uh, how does the variation get generated? And that's where this idea of mutation is important. Now, in mutation, now if you just think about it, that when, when organisms make offspring, they have to duplicate their genes. There's, there's machinery inside the cell which duplicates the genes, and so that that's the way the offspring get genes that were present in both parents. Now that duplication machinery, every now and then, introduces a change or difference, and you can analogize it to um, a Xerox machine. When a Xerox machine makes copies, you take the copy and you put it next to the original. By golly, there are a few differences now. Now typically, the differences are not desirable. So you look at it, you say, that's a smudge. I really don't like that. And you take, might take some white out or something and try to uh, remove it. But occasionally, you can imagine that the copy would have something in it that the original didn't, that you actually like, that you actually think is an improvement. Like you could take a sheet of paper, and especially in California, it's many of you know, there are never any clouds in the sky when it's sunny. So it's a boring sky. It would be nice to see some clouds. Well, your Xerox machine might just give them to you. <laughs> it might. And if it did, you would have what biologists call a favorable mutation. You will have had a change between the copy and the original, which is better than the original one. 
okay, under those circumstances. Now, somebody else may not like clouds. So if you like clouds, you're, so to speak, creating the environment for the piece of paper. All right? If somebody else doesn't like clouds, well, then that's not a favorable mutation to them. So the mutation is favorable relative to some context, some environment. So here's what happens. Then. So you get these copying differences, generating variation. And then, lo and behold, some of the, some of the variants are crummy. And some of the variants are good. Well, then when you take your piece of paper and you copy it again in the Xerox machine, you make more copies. But you don't copy the bad one. You only copy the good ones. So now you look at your sheaf of papers, and the sheaf of papers differs from what it did originally. So now you have a lot of variation, and some of which, some of these papers have clouds and some don't. And again, these might not have very nice clouds, so you don't reproduce those. But these do have nice clouds, and you reproduce them. And slowly but surely, after one replication, one replication after another, their, your pile of papers starts to look really good. And so your population of pages has changed through time. And this is natural selection, plain and simple. And it involves inheritance. Okay, so this picture with the clouds in it gave rise to a copy. So that's inheritance. And then there's selection, where you don't bother reproducing the lousy ones, and you're only reproducing the good ones. And that, in a nutshell, is evolutionary theory. Okay? Now, that's what we teach in school. That's all there is to it. So then the question arises, is there anything objectionable about this to someone of faith? Is there anything that would seem hostile to someone from a Christian tradition? So here I'd like to call your attention to two passages, rather extended passages in the Bible, which present precisely these two ideas, the ideas of mutation, random mutation, and the ideas of selection. So the, the Bible doesn't put them together into an evolutionary theory, but by golly, the ingredients of evolutionary theory are already in the Bible. Now, one of them involves the selection part. And this refers to a section in the Old Testament. And I'll just read it. Jacob, as recompense for previous injustices, makes a deal with his master, Laban, to keep for himself the cattle who are speckled. So Jacob gets the, the speckled cattle. Okay? Laban gets the others. And here's the, here's, this is neat. And it came to pass... When the stronger cattle did conceive, the feebler were the bonds, and the stronger were Jacob's. And the angel of God spake unto Jacob and said, Lift up thine eyes and see, I love this phrase, all the rams which leap upon the cattle are speckled. So it's the speckled rams that are doing all the mating, right? For I have seen all that Laban has doeth unto thee. So here we have... God being the agent or the cause of an evolutionary change. So God is causing the speckled of um, the angel of God is causing the speckled of uh, rams to do the breeding. And then lo and behold the stock comes to consist of speckled rams and they belong to Jacob. And Levon the bond gets screwed. <laughs> but in the, in the Bible, he deserved it. <laughs> I mean, there is a, a history here. So, in this case, you have God's hand molding the evolution of the lives, livestock in Jacob's favor by determining which rams bred and which, that, namely, the ones that leapt upon their mates. So, there it is. I mean, that. That could be in an evolutionary biology textbook. Right? That's, that's the selection part. Now, uh, a lot of people get upset at the idea of mutations being uh, random. <clears throat> now, 
By random, we mean, for example, if you put the paper into uh, your Xerox machine, you don't really know where the clouds are going to come or where the smudges are going to come. You just run the machine, you get the copy, you look at it, and you say, aha, that's a great cloud. I think I'm going to keep it. Or you say, that's a lousy smudge, I'm going to throw that piece of paper away. But you didn't know beforehand whether the piece of paper was going to be good or not. That's what it means to be random here. You just let the process work, and the copying process produces some random uh, changes. And then you go ahead and select on the good ones. We have the same idea of randomness uh, in the Bible as well. And here's another passage, this from the New Testament. And this is in the lectionary, you've probably heard it many times. Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because there was no deepness in the earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. But some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But others fell onto good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So what you have here is the sower just tossing seeds out, throwing seeds out, and the seeds land in different spots. Okay? But he throws them out at random. And the analogy actually is that uh, Jesus is giving messages to an assembled crowd. And he's just giving the messages to everybody. But the messages come to some who can hear the message, and then they do something with it. But sometimes the message falls on deaf ears. It's the same idea here. The seeds are spread, and sometimes they land on good ground. Sometimes they land on crummy ground. And if they land on good ground, then they prosper. Now, it's the same thing with mutations. If you can think of a mutation as like a mustard seed of DNA. Right? So the copying process makes DNA in your children, in your children's children. And there are every now and then changes that occur in the DNA. And if those changed chunks of DNA work well in the body they find themselves in, then that body prospers and those genes get uh, propagated into the next generation. And mutations, random mutations, are just like the concept of these random seeds being dispersed. And there's nothing inherently hostile to the Christian tradition in the notion of randomness or of random mutation. It doesn't mean evolution is random. It means the source of the variation is random. But the direction of evolution is set by the selection part, not the mutation part. And the selection part may very well be guided by the hand of God, as per the uh, previous quotation. So I think it's pretty clear, frankly, that there is no necessary conflict between basic evolutionary theory and the Bible. And, uh, and I've been pointing that out now for several years. However, um, there is a lot of debate on this matter. So, I'd like to now show you three slides from three of the main players, or there are a lot of players, but three of the main players in the uh, um, Christian response to evolution. Now, the first, the, and one of the most important, is the response of the Roman Catholic Church to evolutionary biology. And I have a quote here at some length. This is actually an encyclical from Pope Pius XII. So this is a very official, infallible document in the Roman Catholic Church. And basically it's pro-evolution. It says, the teaching authority of the church does not forbid that research and discussions take place with regard to the doctrine of evolution, insofar as it inquires into the origin of the human body as coming from pre-existent and living matter. Okay. So the Roman Catholic Church is coming down on the bodily continuity. You know, that's the tree of life issue. 
For the Catholic faith obliges us to hold that souls are immediately created by God, but not the body. <coughs> However, this must be done in such a way that uh, reasons of, for both opinions, i.e. those favorable and unfavorable, should be weighed and judged with the necessary seriousness. Okay, so that's 1950. As a result of this, there is actually no creationist argument in all of South America and Central America. You go to the, the Roman Catholic countries, you don't find any of this uh, debate about creationism. Um, it's only in countries with a Protestant tradition. So then in 1996, we have Pope John Paul II, who strengthens uh, this encyclical. And it says, today, almost half a century after the publication of the encyclical, so that's 1950 to 1996, fresh knowledge has, read to the, has led to the recognition that evolution is more than a hypothesis, and acknowledge, quote, a series of discoveries that have led to progressive acceptance by researchers. And so at this time, uh, the Roman Catholic tradition, which is obviously a Christian tradition, is solidly behind um, evolution. But that's not to say they are behind everything that any scientist says, but behind evolution in general. And you'll see there's a lot of objection sometimes to scientists overstepping science and declaring that uh, um, from their knowledge there is no empathy in the world, there's no goodness in the world, or uh, if they go beyond science into philosophy or into theology, then that's quite another matter. But as for the existence of evolution itself, the Roman Catholic Church is there. In contrast, we have a very uh, interesting and very contemporary expression of uh, a Christian response from someone named Ken Ham, and his uh, website is called Answers in Genesis, and he's the person who is responsible for uh, funding and, and building something called the Creation Museum, which is in Ohio. And these are the the premises that Ken Ham argues. He says, quote, the account of origins presented in Genesis is a simple but factual presentation of actual events and therefore provides a reliable framework for scientific research into the question of the origin, history of life, mankind, the earth, and the universe. So this is literal Genesis. And he says, the various original life forms or kinds, including mankind, were made by direct creative acts of God. The living descendants of any of the original kinds, apart from man, re represent more than one species today, representing the genetic potential of the original kind. Now, the problem with that is that all the kinds we have belong to one tree, one common tree. So, for this to be true, we would need to have separate trees. And there's no evidence for that. Now, this is interesting. The creation of the earth and animals, including the dinosaurs, occurred only thousands of years ago, perhaps only 6,000 years ago, not millions of years. So in this, Ken Ham is I identifying as a so-called young earth creationist. And if you get into this literature, you find there are many flavors of creationism. And his version, highly branded here, is the young earth creationism. And the argument is that there are that the earth is only 6,000 years old, and his grounds for that come from uh, calculating the number of generations that it's supposed to have occurred since Adam and Eve. And if you work it out, uh, you get uh, 6,000. Now that's interesting because as a result of this commitment on his part that the Earth is only 6,000 years old, he has to assert that dinosaurs are also 
only 6,000 years old. Okay? So he's committed, first of all, to Genesis in the 6,000. So then you have to go to dinosaurs, because there's no denying that they're dinosaurs. So one of the main dioramas in this um, museum is right here, a state-of-the-art 70,000 square foot museum. Adam and Eve live in the Garden of Eden, and children and dinosaurs roam near Eden's rivers 6,000 years ago. So here we have children playing with dinosaurs. This is being asserted on the basis of, the, of Genesis, and, and, and interpretation of Genesis. And I might add that the herbivore right here, that the dinosaur is a herbivore, because this is before the fall of Adam, and so we don't have any violence in the world here. Of course, if you look at a dinosaur's teeth, they are obviously <laughs> not herbivores. <laughs> and, and it's just worth saying for the record, that dinosaur bones are never found with human bones or with animal bones. Human bones are found with other mammals, like mastodons and, and, and many, many large mammals that are now extinct. So dinosaurs lived, obviously, uh, many millennia before any mammals. So the age of dinosaurs precedes the mammals. So this is a difficult um, uh, proposition to deal with as a scientist because it's directly contradicted by all the evidence and yet this is very fervent <coughs> belief. But, so this is, these people are big players in the uh, Christian response to uh, evolution. Now the third group I'd like to uh, uh, single out or call your attention to are the people known as intelligent design advocates. And these folks are older creationists, not newer creationists. So they acknowledge that the Earth is very old. So here are what their premises are. Now, this traces, this whole movement was started by a guy named Philip Johnson. There's a picture of him right here. And he's a lawyer, or was when he was still alive, he was a lawyer at Berkeley. And is very sharp. And he, in my opinion, internalized the Scopes trial a lot. You know, uh, that uh, in the movie Inherit the Wind with Spencer Tracy, that many of you have seen. And throughout his writing, Darwin on Prophets, you see the, the wording right here, Darwin on Trial, it's almost like he would like to replay the Scopes trial and he'd win. So there's this element of, I could do a better job than uh, the others. Now, let me go through this. So a creationist is simply a person who believes that the world, and especially mankind, was designed and exists for a purpose. Now that's, a, that's an interesting claim, because if that's what a creationist is, then just about everyone who believes in God is a creationist. Okay. So this is a very broad, broad definition of a creationist, and goes uh, completely, completely differs from a young earth creationist. Most, most people think of creationists as people like Ken Ham. And then he says this, I assume that the creation scientists, like Ken Ham, are biased by their pre-commitments to biased by pre, their pre-commitments to biblical fundamentalism. I'm not interested in any claims that are based on a literal reading of the Bible. Now, so these guys are directly in opposition to the young earth creationists. Okay, so it's not as though they're going to go to bed today. And so then he says, there is no reason to doubt that peculiar circumstances could sometimes favor dark colored moths as opposed to light colored moths. Everyone agrees that microevolution occurs. And the reference right here is to a classic study of evolution in, in nature where uh, at the time of uh, uh, the Industrial Revolution in, uh, in England, there was a lot of soot on all the trees, and uh, the moths evolved uh, a dark coloration so that they blended in with the soot. And then when, they, when the Brits cleaned up their act and removed 
a lot of the air pollution, then the trees reverted to their color uh, with lichen and natural bark. And then the, the moths uh, followed. Uh, and so the moths then evolved to become lighter after the pollution was eliminated. And the studies, this was by uh, scientists named Kettlewell, showed that it was bird predation that was responsible for this. If the color of the moth differed from the background color, then uh, uh, birds uh, ate them. So we had direct observation of who was doing the selecting. So he's buying into that. Okay, that sounds fine. But then he says, however, many organs require an intricate combination of complex parts to perform their function. How can such things be built up by infinitesimally small inherited variations, each profitable? So what Johnson's doing is, first of all, distancing himself from the religion, the religion people, but saying he doesn't buy evolution either. He's just not persuaded that it's plausible that the gradual accumulation of small mutations would lead to the big diversity we have today of all these animals. Now that's a kind of sophisticated question right here. That's a technical question of how many mutations do we have? What is the underlying structure of the mutations and the genes? And to make a long story short, what these guys are getting wrong, in my opinion, is that a complicated organism, that is, bigger than single cell, multicellular organisms, are built up from modules. So you take a module, and you take another module, and natural selection will modify them a bit, put them together, and you get complex organ organisms being built up from the assembly of modules, this modular construction that underlies the body is very important. Now, when you think about it, think of an analogy to a computer program. Uh, a computer program, for example, no one writes the whole computer program from scratch. What you do is you build, up, you build it from pieces that are around. If you've ever looked at a computer program and you see the windows, the windows always look the same. Why do the windows look the same? That's because everybody who's writing programs uses the same code for windows. So the windows for all the different programs on a Mac look like one thing. And for them on the Windows machine, they look like another thing. They're built up from modules. And that's how you get great, big, complicated things built. But these guys cite the modular literature, but I don't think they appreciate that it actually is an answer to their question of how can such things be built. At um, any rate, they're the main players to be aware of. The uh, status of the Roman Catholic Church, then the young earth creationists, and then the intelligent design people are the old earth creationists. And so they're the people contributing to the literature at this time. So then we come to the question of, all right, if so much is clear about evolution. What isn't clear? Where are the problems? And there are a number of areas, but what I want to focus on the most because of its social relevance is uh, the evolution of gender and sexuality. Now, as we all know in our lives, um, the emergence of uh, variation in gender and sexuality among people has posed all kinds of uh, problems for us in different walks of life. It's been a problem for us in the religious sector where we're trying to understand how to deal with uh, uh, inclusion and what the concept of inclusion means. It's a problem in the legal sector where people are trying to understand what constitutes marriage and, and what the differentiation is between a civil marriage and a religious marriage. And so you're aware of all these problems. But you might not be aware that we're having a lot of problems in science, too. That we didn't know that there's as much diversity as there is. And we're hustling to try to explain this. And this next slide will point out how, unfortunately, Darwin is on the wrong side in this discussion. And that's always a big call for biologists, because we like Darwin. And so 
Darwin says in, 19, in 1871, males of almost all animals have stronger passions than females. Maybe you get <laughs> the passionate male here. But you'll notice the phrase, almost all animals. And the female, with the rarest of exceptions, is less eager than the male. She is coy. You get the coy female. The rarest of exceptions. So the idea is that if you go out into nature and you pick up your random species, you just pick up your butterfly or a uh, bird or whatever, but just pick up a species. By golly, in that species, the male is supposed to be more passionate and the female more coy. Because these are supposed to be universal generalizations here, with a teeny number of exceptions you don't have to worry about. And of course, he's very interested in the uh, peacock. They're all over the place in England. And so he says, females choose mates who are... So, so why does the peacock have his tail and these ornaments? The reason is supposed to be that females choose mates who are more attractive, vigorous, and well-armed just as man can give beauty to his male poultry. So the idea is that females, by deciding who to sleep with, are basically breeding the males to have the properties that they do. That's Darwin's explanation for ornaments and armaments in the uh, species. Now, the problem is that this is not clearly true at all. Um, these generalizations turn out not to be true, or general, not to be true as generalizations. And these, this claim is also probably incorrect, that that's not why the peacocks have their tails, is because uh, females would only sleep with the males who have great tails. The, uh, <laughs> the, the evidence actually is that they don't give it to him. <laughs> and, uh, and so this is highly overrated as an ornament. It's not like a dime you know. Uh, an eye spot is not a female peacock's best friend. So, first of all, so let me show you some of the exceptions which we're finding really troublesome. <laughs> First of all, there is a phenomenon called sex role reversal. And you see this exemplified in the seahorses. Now, in the seahorses, um, the, this, is, this is the picture of a pipefish here. A pipefish is a, sort of a long, skinny fish that's, uh, whose shape sort of resembles a flute. And that's why it's called a pipefish. And the seahorse is a modified pipefish that has a skin flap on its tummy. And so what females do is they deposit eggs into the skin flap of the male, and the male becomes, so to speak, pregnant. And this is a big problem right here for biologists because sperm are supposed to be cheap, according to the party line. It's supposed to be the males are supposed to have all sorts of sperm. They're supposed to be able to just go around and fertilize any old female who will, who will accept them. Okay, they're passionate. And the males are supposed to be coy, and they're supposed to look at all these guys and say, not you, not you, not you. Um, I'll only sleep with the ones with the best genes. And, uh, but that depends on sperm being cheap. So here what we find is that the eggs are cheap. The females go around, hunting around for males, willing to accept eggs. And they occasionally find them. And the, and the male can be coy. and say, well, I'm not going to take your eggs. <laughs> and they do. That's sex role reversal. And that's a direct contradiction to the generalizations that Darwin is enunciating. So that's a problem. Why does this happen? It did evolve for some reason. But why? Now, another one involves um, the issue of the gender binary, of the gender binary. Now, first of all, biologists define male and female based on the size of the gamete. The gamete is the egg of the sperm. These are the cells that have to fuse with one another to make an embryo. And in uh, just about all species, 
there are only two sizes of gametes, a tiny one and a big one. The tiny one, by definition, is called a sperm. The big one, by definition, is called an egg. That's the definition of an egg is it's the larger of the two gamete sizes. The definition of a sperm is that it's a smaller one. Okay? Now, a male individual would be one who makes sperm, and a female individual would be one who makes eggs. And a hermaphrodite is one who makes both eggs and sperm. Okay? Now what happens in a great many species, including coral reef uh, fish, and you can go actually snorkeling on our coral reefs here, and about a third of the species you see are ones in which the animals change sex. What that means is they switch from making sperm to making egg or from making egg to making sperm. That's what it means to change sex, because sex is defined on the basis of the size of the gamete. So if you change the size of the gamete that you're making, you have changed your sex. So these are uh, blue-headed grasses here. Here they start out as female and turn into male. These are clownfish. So we don't have here. You see them in Tahiti, though. Um, they live in sea anemones. These are like Dr. Nemo. And so these start out as male and turn into female. And these are hamlets, which are kind of bass. And these are male and female at the same time. So here is a pair of them mating. They don't self-fertilize, they cross-fertilize. And so one will lay eggs, and the other will release sperm. And then they'll do a somersault and switch roles. Then the one that had been releasing sperm will release eggs and vice versa. So, what we see here is that although the definition of male and female in terms of gamete size is fixed, is stable, the definition of male and female at the whole organism level is not stable. We have individuals changing, size, changing sexes or being both sexes at the same time. And this is quite common. So this is very difficult to explain. And it's a problem. Now, the gender of, the, of, a, of an animal would be the uh, appearance and behavior by which the animal expresses what its sex is. So if it's a male, it's a male because it makes sperm, but it'll have certain colors and shapes and sizes and behaviors. All of that is its gender, how it expresses its sexual identity. Now it turns out that there are more than two genders in lots of species. Now this is a very interesting case of the ruff, R-U-F-F, -F, which is a seabird, from, um, uh, uh, from, from Scandinavia. And here there are three genders of males and one gender of female. Here's a female. And here's a gender where the males all have uh, a black collar. Here's a gender where they have a white collar. And here's a gender where they have no collar. And these all have very different ways of exp expressing their masculinity. What these guys do is they set up little territories. So on a table like this, there would be one of them here and one of them here. So these are called courts. And the collection of them is called a lek, which is absolutely spelled L-E-K, a lek. And so these guys set up these courts. And the females are off over there foraging with the seeds and things. Or little invertebrates, actually, with that kind of mouth. That's the mouth that poking in the mud and eat little uh, worms and things. So then the white collared males hang out with the females for a while. When these guys are setting up territories, the white collared males hanging out over here. And after a while, he does leave them and comes to the black collared males. Then the black collared males court them, they solicit them. So that some of the black collared males wind up getting a partner, a white collared male. They get a, a pair of males here, and maybe one male there if he just stayed, uh, if it's just a black collared male. So then the females come in, and the females look at all these males, and they see a couple of males there, one male here, and apparently the females prefer to mate with a pair of males. 
than with a single one. And why? Well, nobody knows for sure. One conjecture is that the white-collared male gets to know the females personally because he's hanging out with them. <laughs> so that when the females come to the lick, the white-collared male over here can make introductions. <laughs> <laughs> But it's a fact. There are two kinds of males. There's actually a third kind of male which has no collar, and its role is not uh, documented yet. It took a little while to establish it was a male because since it doesn't have a collar, biologists were confusing them with females. But they're males, and the males know. And then you get this picture right here, which represents two males mounting. So there's a black collared male mounting an uncollared male. And they also go the other way around. So this would be a homosexual mounting, but a heterogenderal mounting, because they're from different genders, but they're both uh, male, so that would make them homosexual. Well, there are an awful lot, it's now become clear that there are hundreds and hundreds of uh, species in which there are not a, in which the same sex matings are both homosexual and homogenderal. Okay. And I'll show you some slides of that. This is a very interesting case. I was lecturing in Brazil and um, this guy from the equivalent of Time magazine in Brazil came up to me and said, you've got to get these slides. Some, some people sent us these slides. It's a photographer who was on vacation in the Serengeti and took these slides and was absolutely stunned. And so he gave them to this magazine and the, magazine, the guy in the magazine gave them to me. And I've incorporated them ever since. So here are two lions. You can tell that they're lions by their manes here. Okay? Because a female lion doesn't have a mane. Now look at this lion approach the other one. Approaches it. Now, any of you who had cats will know that that's a friendly gesture. When our cat does this, it wants food. <laughs> and um, so it, then this one lies down, and the other one comes along and mounts it. So it solicited a same sex mate. So it's so homosexual and homogenderal. Okay, now the hundreds and hundreds of species of this. Now that's a problem for us uh, in biology. And uh, the reason is, of course, that we operate under the premise that mating takes place in order to make, uh, in, in order to, to make offspring. But here we have matings taking place for social roles that have nothing to do directly with mating offspring. Now these two guys might be very good buddies. And they may, as a result of this, team up and capture some females and make offspring that way. But socially, this is bonding. And so we see this decoupling of sexual activity from direct reproductive activity. We find a lot of the sexual activity is really uh, has a social function. <coughs> and why? Now. What, what I, this is some of my work, uh, I've been arguing that it's actually a mistake for us to focus on the sex part. That what we're really looking at right here is a special case of physical intimacy between animals. And there's a lot of physical intimacy going on. These are macaws right here. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this, it's quite easy to see if you, you, you macaws and parrots, where they uh, groom each other, they preen each other's feathers. Right here. here are horses that nuzzle each other. Here are kittens that lick each other. These are called lovebirds here, for obvious reasons. And that's another macaw. And then you see all this physical intimacy among primates. So my, what I've been publishing on is to say that it's a mistake to look at all the homosexual matings as homosexuality. 
Instead, it's just a special case of physical intimacy in animals. And there's all this physical intimacy, and that's what we should be trying to explain. And why is there so much physical intimacy in animals? Well, my theory has to do with how this lets them cooperate and lets them uh, come to joint solutions to common problems. But also, that's physical intimacy. I'd like to suggest that there's a lot of vocal intimacy as well. And that in all of the unifying feature to all of this intimacy is that it's a way for the animals to share reciprocal pleasure. They enjoy this. That's why they're doing it. And it's why those two lions were doing what they're doing. It's through the shared enjoyment that they can develop the trust with one another to work cooperatively. And so let's see if this works. Okay, now this is a um, duetting. These are wrens that come from Panama and Costa Rica. And the reason are, and one of them is male, one of them is female. The male one is the one making sound underneath the dark bar here. And you can tell it's a male because you hear these, these chirp, chirp, chirps. And the three of them at the end. Let me play it again. And listen carefully. Chuk, chuk, chuk. That's the male. Okay? So this is duetting. And so, for those of you who are in the choir, I think it's much like the same thing. You feel good when you're on tune. And that's what they're feeling like. Now, these are lace on albatrosses. This is my last example. These are some of the Koguni birds, and they're here in Kauai. So these are uh, around Kilauea Point, Kilauea Lighthouse. They're on. Um, um, Midway, they're very common in Midway. And uh, so here, look at these guys. These are the juvenile. These are the. These are young, right here. These would be juveniles. These have come back after the first year. These are. These are still in the nest. These dolphins. And again, we have this phenomenon. Now, I don't see any qualitative difference between the physical intimacy that we see in this slide, the calling, and the same-sex sexuality. It seems like it's all the same thing. The reciprocal exchange of pleasure, whose adaptive significance is that it promotes co cooperation between animals. So I'm now shameless enough to conclude with some pictures of uh, my books. Um, <laughs> so one of them is called Evolution's Rainbow. It's now just been released in the 10th uh, year anniversary edition. It sold about 20,000 copies. It's been translated into Korean and Portuguese. My most recent biology book is called The Genial Gene, which some of you will recognize as a play or a counter to Richard Dawkins' The Selfish Gene. And it's now translated into French. And this is the book, a small little book I wrote for the church I was in in San Francisco on evolution and Christian. And then I have to say, I'm working on my first novel right now, and it's called Ram 2050, and it's a retelling of the Ramayana from India uh, being set in the year 2050. And I hope to have that done by the late summer or fall. So, um, 
that's it. And thank you so much for listening. So intently. So this stuff about um, self-replicating RNAs is the first uh, glimmer of a new insight into the primordial soup story that I've heard. And um, as they say, that's uh, the kind of evolutionary biology that I'm discussing here assumes that we already have life. And the question is how it changes. We have time for one more question, if there is another question. Comment. On, um, for, I can only speak for myself, but the way I reconcile creationism with evolution is, is simple. Is that evolution, for the concept and the mechanics of it, was created. So then, if you really think about that, you can start applying that to a lot of different problems that you see there. If you say that the evolutionary process wasn't created or it's only thing. And I'm not saying whether that's right or wrong, it's just my comment is that that helps me reconcile yeah. the two things so I don't have to worry about it very much. And so I, it's, I'm comforted with <coughs> my uh, reconcilement. That. Yeah, that's, that's the theistic evolution position. And that's also mine, for what it's worth. That uh, okay. I mean, the question is, um, uh, I, mean, the, 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 I think the theological question to deal with is, did God create a static Earth or a dynamic Earth? Yeah, my opinion is dynamic. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. I, I know. Uh, but <laughs> in addition, uh, I, I personally think that, that there's some passages in Genesis, uh, chapter 2, that speak to the creation of the processes. So, for example, um, God talks about creating the rain and the rivers to make the plants grow. Now, God doesn't reach down to a sapling and make the sapling grow. He creates the rain, and the rain makes the sapling grow, and he creates the rivers. And so, my interpretation of Genesis 2 is that God created a dynamic earth, and as part of that, we would get evolutionary processes. And, and geologic processes and all the dynamic processes that we have. And that's God's way, so to speak, to uh, flesh out uh, 
his vision of the universe and to, to make the universe uh, occur or unfold in the fullness of time. And so um, just about everyone who's a, a, a Christian and a scientist lines up on the theistic evolution position. And I didn't quote those folks here because they're not the big players that the Roman Catholic Church is or the intelligent design people or the young earth creationists. They're the ones you hear in the headlines all the time. But um, uh, the director, for example, of the National Institutes of Health, whose name I'm having trouble remembering at the moment, um, but in any case, he's, for example, he's even relatively fundamentalist. He sees evidence for God in the beauty of rainfall, of, of waterfalls, for example, and so forth. Um, I, I think another theological question we have to deal with is what the role of evidence is in, in belief. And do you need evidence for belief? And I don't think the Bible speaks with one voice on this because sometimes the Bible talks about Jesus working certain miracles and then everyone sees the miracle and be, hey, wow, that's nifty. I'm going to believe in God. You know, and you get this kind of evidence-based justification for, research, for a belief sometimes. And then at other times, uh, you, you know, the, the question is, can you have belief even in the absence of evidence? And I think that's a, that's a harder one. And uh, uh, so, so some, some scientists find evidence, evidence for God in the beauty of nature uh, as well. But in any case, I think the question of the um, dynamic Earth is, is important. And let me say one other thing about that. Um, if you do believe that God created a dynamic Earth and that evolution and geologic processes are the way for him to realize his, his uh, concept of cre his, 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 uh, his creation, um, it would then follow that... Um, that trying to discover these mechanisms, trying to discover geologic processes and evolutionary processes is a form of prayer. And that it's a uh, sacred activity then to try to under, uh, understand what these processes are. And that therefore the activity of doing science is actually furthering um, a, um, a sacred or, or you might even say devotional uh, life. Um, as opposed to being an oppositional life. Which is an, an, an elaboration of your point. Yeah. Incredible. Incredible. Well, if you are at all um, intrigued by this, which I'm sure you are, and want to, we do have refreshments for you, and you can talk with each other and with Dr. Joan. And um, also we have some of her books for sale, if any of them intrigue you. Um, they're back there as well. And we want to thank you so much for coming. And want to let you know that next week we have another event at Duke's, and that is an, a Lent event um, where we're taking a look at the biblical story and where psychology intersect. And, and Dr. Um, Susan Davis is going to be leading that. So if you're interested in that, there's a $25. You get breakfast and lunch for that at Duke's. Uh, but we definitely want to want to thank you. This is just, it, it's like was entering into the mystery. It just kept, wasn't it? It was. It was very prayerful to hear you. Thank you for bringing, that was a wonderful conclusion about being devotional. It really was. Thank you so much. It was. It was incredible. It was incredible. <laughs>